You've heard it. Hello everyone who's listening in. Welcome to this session Snowden Effect versus the Privacy Paradox. We are your translators for the session. My name is Rumsteak. Uh, my name is Tribute. Oh, thanks. thanks for having me. Uh, we're glad to be here. We are scientists doing research and communication. And this is a special occasion. Uh, the audience, the sheer size, this is very interesting and exciting for us. Now, before we get started, um, let me just explain a little bit what we are doing here. We have seen a lot of talks at this Congress, and we have seen people present things that that, that affect the digital and the electronic world and make things better. And the thing that we focus on is an attempt to to understand the world and the people who live in this world. And, and we're going to have a look at this with special regards to things like the privacy paradox and the Snowden effect. Our talk is divided into three episodes. Episode one will be the Facebook menace. The Facebook bedrohung is dabei. The Facebook menace is just like the rest of the study, um, a paradox, because we are moving between privacy and social networks, or trust and data privacy and data security, and these are topics that are widely regarded as a paradox nowadays, and we're going to try to find out the attitude of Facebook users towards data privacy and data protection. And, of course, we wrap this into cool stories. Well, it's a Star Wars theme, but before I promise too much, the media scientist strikes back. Uh, let's first talk a little bit about the study and how we did this and how we interviewed people. Now, if I ask into the audience, what is trust? I guess a lot of people would say, well, I kind of, sort of kind of understand what you mean, but this is not enough. So let's, let's take a few steps back into the 13th century. A uh, holy man of the 13th century said that trust is hope that's Certain things will be fulfilled, and it's also trust in God. Now, a lot of people here don't go to church uh, in, and pray for data security, and we don't do that either. But we said when we present this, and when we go to a congress and present our results and, and our thoughts, then this has to be it, because uh, we know that you know a lot more about that stuff than we do. But we have also seen that the definition is very, uh, very naive. Eve, uh, the good Lord will take care of it, but this is not something that we can do. So we jumped into the uh, 20th century and looked at what Georg Simmel said about that. And he said it's uh, some sort of situation between knowing and not knowing and making hypotheses about future actions. And this, well, there's some sort of skepticism here that has to be of interest for us. Because we know a lot more than we used to, and the trust has suffered from that knowledge, and we can start to work with that. Eventually, we went with this definition, uh, Goldbeck and Händler, trust in a person is a commitment to an action, or well, you can read it on the slides. This definition is uh, very egocentric in a way. Now, if I have trust in someone, in a person, or in the government, for example, then in the best case, this should have uh, good effects on myself. Um, we will get back to that later. So let's have let's jump to privacy. We don't have to go back as much. We only have to go back onto, until 1890. There was a very famous essay. It was called The Right to Privacy. The Right to be Let Alone. I think you have to add that this was written by two very famous uh, legal experts in the US. But they kind of had the problem that the press was very interested in their private lives and their families, so that's kind of why they uh, decided to, to write this 
this essay and they kind of defined the term negative freedom. So we also have the right to say that this is my private sphere and you cannot enter. I don't want you to enter into my private sphere. Now, in former times, philosophers said that this is a very good start and they kind of start to split that into dimensions into informational dimensions. This is interesting when it's uh, when we're talking about data about persons. And there are also certain certain liberties to make decisions. When you when we say uh, this doesn't concern you, that's not your business. And it doesn't really matter if it's a real room, just like here, or if it's a virtual room or a metaphoric room. And we thought we can bundle this into a definition selective control of access to the self. Into the definition of old man, selective control of access to the self. Now the digital self is something that interests us a lot. And as you can see from these terms, it's always a process where you have to balance things. And it's always about other persons as well. And Altman says that privacy, and this is very important, privacy is not the same as isolation. It does not mean that I isolate myself from from others, but instead it's it's about balancing how much social interaction do I want to do and what kind of information do I want to open and, and where do I want to set a limit. So um, just, just tell enough so that you are successful socially, but keep enough secret so that so that you can uh, that you can live with it. And when you manage to balance that, then you have an optimum level of privacy. And since the NSA scandal several actors see a drop in the trust into their actions, into what they do, into the way they argument. We also see that we, there is a large outcry for privacy. Everyone wants to be private. We say this is not something that you should see. And a lot of people don't really have a good idea what that means and what the consequences would be. And what's interesting is that people say one thing and act differently. And this is what brings us to the privacy paradox. Indeed, it has been shown that users of social network sites state that they are worried about their privacy, but put at the same time detailed personal information on their profiles. This phenomenon has been described as the privacy paradox. Es ist also paradox, weil so it's paradox because what we expect from privacy does not agree with what we do. So we cannot really balance these, these two principles. And for our study, this is of high interest because we ask ourselves, did the NSA scandal change anything? Um, and do people start to think about all that? And certain studies make us make us hope and let us... Well, there have been a couple of studies in 2013. Fitkau and Maas say the trust in data security has been damaged. 60% say uh, it cannot be that trust cannot be regained anymore. And there are other studies that say that even users who are not technical experts are very critical now and other studies say that the cloud service industry could shrink by about 50 billion dollars because the trust in the services has vanished and about the e-government the users tend to use e-government services less and less because they are afraid that their data is going to be stolen so, is there a Snowden effect? That's something that we could wonder. Do people start to think about these things differently? Do people start to use social networks differently? Or, well, we couldn't, kind of re couldn't resist. Is there a new dawn? So, we did a study that we grouped into two steps. We did a pre-study where we took all these articles about the NSA scandal and analyzed the contents of these articles. We used 60 articles from Germany, the UK and the USA uh, that were published between June 2013 to April 2014. And we looked at several of these articles and looked in what way the information that is, is presented there and is discussed there and use that information for a study. Now, the main study was an online interview or an online query. So people who are interested in all that tend to participate in that study. And 
This was in the time between July to October 2014, so it's it's quite current. So things that we asked about was the general usage of Facebook, and then there was uh, a man. His his name is actually Sheldon. Uh, the motives why people use Facebook. Uh, the third step was to compare. Well, we refer to a Bitcom study there. We compared the requirements to social networks and privacy in social networks. And that is something that we considered as well. And there is also something, uh, an instrument called QCIF3. It's about interpersonal trust. And these criteria that this uh, in this QCIF instrument are pretty interesting. Point five is activities of intelligence services and in the final step it's about social, social demographics and this is what our sample looked like we had 526 participants and 84% of these are Facebook users so that is 441 people the average education that kind of shows who, which people are interested in that scandal and what was interesting is that the people that have signed up for Facebook, 70% of those use their real name and 30% use a fake name. And that's when it becomes interesting uh, because Michael is going to continue um, but, and is going to explain uh, what the real motivation to do all this looks like. And uh, yeah, we uh, gave it the title uh, Attack of the Cyber Warriors. And uh, Matthias said uh, on the uh, 6th of uh, July uh, 2013, uh, it uh, became clear that the NSA did surveillance uh, on a lot of people globally. And we uh, chose the title of Cyber War uh, because uh, we were wondering if people uh, know that, uh, the, that it is a cyber war, the media uh, uh, calls it a cyber war. The question is, do people um, change uh, anything about it? And uh, we wanted to uh, learn about that in our main study. And uh, so what we uh, were interested in is, uh, are people uh, aware what, peop uh, what data uh, can uh, 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 can be seen on Facebook. 94 percent uh, uh, seem to know what data is uh, public on Facebook. And uh, when you look at it in a more detailed way, uh, most people uh, s seem to think that their profile uh, is public, the friend list, uh, their profession. And you can see that uh, the uh, general uh, data of your profile uh, is uh, uh, made public um, uh, most likely. Uh, status messages, uh, photos that you uh, uploaded, um, this is uh, more uh, something that you would uh, use privacy settings for. Um, interesting enough, there's 13% uh, that their profile picture uh, is not public, uh, which is interesting because, uh, 13, because the profile picture for Facebook is always public. Um, so it's not clear uh, whether maybe the rest of the data is uh, somewhat skewed by perception. And then we were interested if people uh, read the terms and condition and the uh, data uh, privacy uh, terms and their privacy settings. And we see the first uh, paradoxon um, because 24% uh, uh, read the terms and condition, the privacy terms uh, were read by 34%. In contrast, 97% uh, uh, did uh, tinker with the uh, privacy settings at least once. And uh, Bitcom uh, in 2014 uh, published a study that uh, fits quite well. Uh, and it says that uh, terms and conditions and it, uh, data privacy settings are too complicated for most uh, uh, persons. 12% uh, even say that I don't care, I will uh, click yes anyway uh, and sign up. And in the context of the NSA problem, uh, this is uh, a, a problem, obviously, uh, what we see uh, in the rest of the talk.
Wie bewerten die Nutzer? So, how do people uh, rate the uh, data security on Facebook? We saw the um, privacy settings uh, are nice and well. Everyone uses them, so it works on an interpersonal level. Uh, privacy settings uh, should be uh, should 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 um, control what uh, other friends see, but the uh, data uh, protection terms. Uh, will uh, make decisions on which uh, companies uh, can access it and what uh, data um, fa Facebook itself um, collects. And uh, all of that um, all of that is implicitly in, in the heads of the people. So uh, we asked how uh, secure do you think that your data is? On a uh, scale from one to five, uh, we, all, uh, we almost uh, landed at uh, two. So uh, only uh, about one percent says very secure. The rest uh, is uh, rather terrible. So the question is, Why is Facebook used at all? Uh, there, there must be reasons why you uh, why you do that uh, if you look at the privacy paradox. And Sheldon in 2008 uh, looked at uh, factors for uh, usage of Facebook. And we used that here and we came to this conclusion that... Uh, Uh, talking to people you already know is the uh, most important uh, motive to use Facebook. Um, conversation or uh, entertainment uh, is the um, second most important uh, factor. You've got the uh, smartphone on you, just looking at what what's new. And those are the... Um, uh, Not so important are uh, factors like coolness, uh, so maybe there's some social pressure because the friends are uh, with Facebook and you wanted to see what uh, happens and you maybe want to put yourself uh, out there. And uh, it's not so much the community uh, thing that uh, is more present in forums. And the least important aspect is uh, looking for new uh, contacts. Um, but it's more um, talking to people you already know. Private communication is uh, transferred more and more to the virtual world. And uh, looking at the NSA scandal, that is uh, interesting to see if that is really um, making up for the problems. So we've seen that the um, perceived security of data at Facebook with a rating of two or five uh, is rather low. So we asked and tried to uh, find out the connection to the Bitcom study. Uh, what kind of uh, requirements do you have to Facebook uh, in con consideration of the NSA problems? And we do see some very interesting clusters. If you look at the first uh, three lines, uh, most of uh, the, the people said that uh, data, privacy, data protection is uh, very important. Um, and privacy settings and data security is also very important or important, uh, more than 80% uh, each. And uh, if you look at the functional aspects in contrast, uh, you will see this is uh, not so important for the users. They would uh, rather accept uh, um, less uh, functionality. Um, the um, request is we want to have a secure network. So this is my uh, this is the slide I like best because uh, you see some sort of Stockholm syndrome. <laughs> What kind of requirements have, uh, do we have for uh, data protection? So uh, we clearly uh, talking to the, uh, we're clear, clearly saying to the uh, social networks, uh, you have to make sure that uh, transparency for data usage uh, is important. But those are exactly the people who didn't read the uh, data protection terms, and they are asking for transparency that. There is some uh, disparity here. 
It's paradoxical. And the uh, second request is uh, make sure that uh, better data protection is uh, there. And uh, point three is the uh, government must uh, employ more rules for data protection in social networks. And I'm not sure if we can wait for that. Gerade was auch um, die sozialen Netzwerke betrifft, wir haben mal einen Blick especially in regards to the social networks, uh, we have uh, looked at the data usage uh, terms, and there's a very small uh, excerpt from there, and it explains how they use uh, data that you provide. And the uh, last part says. Uh, your data is used as part of our uh, uh, ongoing commitment to uh, improve products, services and integration uh, more securely. And that sounds, of course, uh, great. Uh, Mark uh, Zuckerberg, uh, when you're listening, if you're listening to this, uh, we, we always try to is uh, uh, equivalent to an F. So if you read this, is it really... Uh, helpful to read those data protection terms or should you think about signing up uh, in general so uh, let's continue die verhaltensveränderung nach dem nsa skandal im speziellen change in behavior after the nsa scandal that was something that interested us haben das noch mal umrissen and we've uh, looked at the changes and it's scary that 56% said uh, no changes, I'll just continue like before. Uh, from the 44% the, that actually changed something, there were uh, different choices. Uh, you could cho choose multiple uh, points uh, to um, change, uh, to, to be more selective in your activities, to change your privacy settings, to remove uh, older settings. So those are not uh, systematic matic changes uh, change to a different social network or sign off completely uh, it's, uh, it's just uh, censoring yourself um, as, as so far you uh, thought about uh, what you wanted to change diese Nutzergruppen interessiert, die Leute, die and, etwas uh, verändert haben. We look more closely at these groups of people who actually did change something. The ones that did not change anything, we call them the, uh, um, the, the keepers, basically. And what we saw is that the differences are quite significant in our study. Even though everything is to the left of the center, and, the, uh, and there is still a lot of criticism due to the NSA activities, um, we can see that the interpersonal trust and we, which means the, the, the people, people who did not change the, the way of usage of Facebook, they had, tend to have more interpersonal trust. Uh, also in daily life, they have more trust to other people, for example. People who did not change their way, their usage patterns tend to accept more and criticize less Und sie schätzen ihre and Daten weniger gefährdet an. They als also Leute, tend to think that their data is not so much in danger as those that have actually changed their usage patterns. So the acceptance of actions of intelligence services, we looked into detail there too. Let me start at the right hand side. Activities from intelligence agencies in the way that the media has reported on them are regarded critically. That is uh, very clear. But we differentiated further. There are different escalation types, if you will, which we have uh, figured out here. Uh, activities that follow a or that, that come with a court order tend to be tolerated more because people say, well, if a court orders that, then I'm not going to question it, basically. Uh, activities without a court order, which are pretty much your classical uh, actions of intelligence services, they tend to be tolerated less. But what's also interesting is that when, when, when multiple intelligence services cooperate, which means when they, when they share the data with each other, and, well, people don't really know what that is. I mean, secret services and intelligence services tend to be looked at as some sort of a black box. People are not really thinking about it, and they 
people might think it's 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 neither good nor bad, so that might explain yeah. that here. And we looked at, uh, with regards to the po privacy paradox, we looked at what's it like. If I do things in social networks, I typically know that I am, that I put my data into the social network, I get a certain use out of it, and there are also certain certain limitations and certain uh, things that you lose. I mean, you cannot control anymore how your data is, is passed on to other companies. Uh, there, is, there are implications for your privacy and all that. And that obviously does not outweigh the, the uh, perceived use. But the differences may not be that big as you would uh, think, but it's, it's uh, sort of, it's, there's not extreme values here. But we did a sort of regression analysis on this and, and double-check these values in, in how far the, the limitating aspects have an influence on the acceptance of the actions of intelligent services and it, it turns out there is an impact on the acceptance. The national security, the, the war against terror and the general uh, general uh, police work basically um, Episode three. I'm sorry I didn't get the rest <laughs> so these are used to uh, legitimate the uh, actions of intelligence services so the last part is uh, the revenge of the user so what uh, is uh, the effect what uh, can the user uh, do and data security and privacy uh, are being criticized, that is uh, obvious, that is uh, something that is not uh, discussed. But there's also a paradoxical effect, uh, private communication via Facebook um, still uh, le legitimizes the restrictions uh, on privacy. So uh, you accept uh, privacy restrictions on Facebook, but still criticize that. Uh, what we've seen is that we don't know what uh, cooperation of intelligence services means. We're uh, unsure what that means. We have high uh, requirements for privacy and data protection, but we have, don't have the knowledge about uh, how far these actions by uh, intelligence services really go and what the uh, what happens with uh, the data we uh, give to uh, facebook that's one of their uh, core um, components uh, to use that data for uh, advertisements etc and bitcom in 2014 uh, has realized that uh, there is now a rise in trust of uh, internet users again and that is, uh, in if you think about what we've heard uh, here in the last three days, that uh, is not something that you might expect. And uh, we want to close with uh, a quote from Edward Snowden in uh, 2013. He told the, Edward, uh, the Washington Post, For me, in terms of personal satisfaction, the mission's already accomplished. I already won. As soon as the journalists were able to work, everything that had been trying uh, to do was validated. Because, remember, I didn't want to change society. Society. I wanted to give society a, to, uh, a chance to determine if it should change itself. And that is exactly what uh, we have been uh, hearing for the last three days, uh, showing uh, security uh, leaks and uh, the media um, that uh, changes uh, public opinion, something uh, that is differentiated, um, that uh, is able to... Um, resolve this uh, privacy paradox um, to uh, enable the uh, society to change itself. Okay, vielen Dank bis hierhin schon mal. All right, thank you very much. nur den Stream des Google Quizzes haben und da nicht allzu viel Vorbereitungszeit für brauchen, haben wir noch ein paar Minuten Zeit für ein paar So we do have some time left for a few uh, questions because there's only the Google Quiz after this. Publiziert ihr die Rohdaten? Do you publish the raw data? Uh, yes, we we will. 
Und dann, wie sieht es aus mit dem technischen Know-how? What about the technical know-how of the people that you have asked? Were those? Do you have any idea what the technical know-how was? Uh, the technical know-how we didn't uh, query. But what we've seen uh, from the uh, persons that we selected is that those were people that are interested in this uh, con uh, context, so maybe there was some uh, advanced knowledge. Well, your argument was that the, uh, that the people that you asked or the, uh, the group was sort of distorted. Did you do any, any, any additional... Habt ihr Möglichkeiten, repräsentativ äh, Daten zu erheben? Do you have the possibility to do representative GFK-Panel oder sonst sowas? Interviews. Zugang, Zugang nicht. Wir haben so unfortunately, we don't have access to a GFK-Panel or something like that. And we wanted to expand the study, uh, especially in an international context, uh, especially if you look at uh, uh, court decisions and uh, how... Uh, Oh. And then we would want to uh, use a uh, greater sample to make sure that the data uh, is correct. And this uh, has been a convenient sample, so there's self-selection, so we uh, can't say that these are necessarily representative. So let's go over to microphone three. Oh, thank you. This pre-study about the... Uh, media reflection on the intelligence services. Why did you do that and what was the result? The pre-study was uh, there to make sure the level of escalation um, to, to op operationalize them. Um, we're not sure what uh, kind of uh, um, measures by intelligence services are known in the public. And we wanted to make sure we understand uh, which measures by the intelligence services uh, are reported by the media and which one can we query. And it's important to know uh, which action actually re results in, um, in, in protest. And we wanted uh, to know that. And so this pre-study was very important. Oh. This one's also about how you have chosen the, pe the people. Where exactly did you publish that? Uh, where, where was it where people participated? Uh, so uh, we did that in an academic context, we're both working at a university and we were supported by Netzpolitik. Uh, we don't want to hide that because that means there's some sort of uh, skew. Uh, so that's why it's a convenient central. So we try to use uh, all the channels that we uh, could use and we try to um, uh, ask uh, newspapers and we got some positive responses from there. Also, habt ihr das so, did you do that by putting uh, ads in newspapers? Because I have a sort of a scientific background and I was kind of wondering, did you, a randomization, did you do that? I don't know, because otherwise you just get the people who read those particular newspapers and that is also some sort of pre-choice just just a question randomization question mark uh yeah that's clear uh this wasn't a panel study that was something that is based on self-selection uh people uh answer those questions because they're interested in that uh, because they want to tell something about it because uh, but uh in s especially on this background it's interesting to look at those uh Results and and it's uh, of course uh, makes uh, it's scary to to look at that uh, having that background. How do you explain that the trust in Facebook has risen recently? There was a recent uh, study uh, in September 2014 by Bitcom and they asked for uh, trust. Uh, interpersonal trust and now we are about 16% uh, trust level um, and that was a very uh, uh, very representative study oh. All right, this concludes the session the